there's always solutions here as well. And you can always message me on Twitter and stuff if you have any particular questions about the code itself. Now we're going to go into cross-validation, which is uh, one of the most widely used ways of seeing how well your model performs. And there's a meme coming up which might be a bit hit or miss. So <laughs> <laughs> please forgive me. <laughs> and so uh, building reliable and accurate models is paramount in machine learning. So obviously you don't want your kids being recommended the human centipede after they've watched A Bug's Life. Oh. <laughs> I saw that on Twitter, I didn't make that one myself. <laughs> However, it can be hard to get new data to pre assess model performance. So we can look at resubstitution error rates, we can look at root mean split errors, but we really want to see how well it does on new data. And so um, you might build your amazing machine learning model, you go to assess model performance, you get your data to test on, but you can't actually get your data to test on. So what do we do in this case? So what we're going to do is we're going to do something called cross-validation, where we use our own data as new data. And so what we do is we split our data into training and testing sets to evaluate performance, and we treat this testing component as new data points. And so of course, when you're doing cross-validation, you won't be using all your data set as to run the model. You're going to be using part of it, and then you're going to use the rest of the data set to predict on. And so if you have a lot of, don't have that much data to begin with, you're going to have a lot less to actually train your model on. So how does this work? So to do this, we split our data into k folds. So the most extreme you could do is you could do just half your data into training and half data into testing. But what we do a lot of the time is we split up into um, half and half. It's quite extreme. You only have half your data into train on. So we can split into um, different folds. Suppose I picked, in this case, three folds. So I split my data into three petitions. What we do is we treat the first petition as a testing set, so we keep that to the side, and then we train our model on the remaining k minus one bit, so the remaining two folds. So here, I kind of split it, I switched the right, different way, but you test on one fold, you train the first two folds and test on the last fold, then you get an error rate for how well it performed in this particular um, training and testing subset. and you get the misclassification error rate. So you just see, and you can also do this for um, regression as well, but mainly this is quite used a lot in um, classification settings. Then you repeat it for the other k folds. So then you, in the second round, you make the middle fold the one that you keep out for testing, and you train it on the outer two folds. Then see how well it performs on predicting the middle set. And then you do it again, um, holding out the last fold and training on the other folds. And so if you do a three-fold cross-validation, you get three sets of error rates that you've computed, and the overall error rate is just the average of these three error rates. And so one of the big debates is how many folds do you pick? And so the, the biggest extreme on one end is just 50-50, so two-fold cross-validation. In this case, you've only got half the data to train your model on, and so your predictions probably won't be that great because you've only got half the data available to predict on. The other extreme is called leave one out cross validation or um, n fold cross validation. We make n um, petitions in your data and you only leave one out to test on and then use n minus one data points to train on. And so that's actually going to do. Um, it's very generous in that case then because you're using pretty much all the data set to predict only one data point. And so if you look at literature online or a lot of textbooks, generally um, K around 5 and 10 are most commonly used. And they're a nice middle ground between two extreme, only two folds, and two extreme on the other end, leave one out cross validation. And this is, relates back to the bias variance trade off. If you have only too few folds, you get high bias, but if you've got too many folds, you've got high variance. And there's a whole debate on Stack Overflow about how many folds to pick and how you interpret it. But just, but I, I tend to use five most of the time, but you can see 10 used quite a bit as well. And so I write right hard, right or wrong between five and 10, it's just analyst preference. So throughout these slides, I'm gonna use five. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna show you is cross-validation 
the hard way first. So there is an easy way at the very end to do this, but well, you're going to hate me. We're going to do it the way I learnt it. Um, <laughs> no, not because I want to inflict pain, but I really appreciate the way I learnt it um, because you're going to be seeing some ball loops. They're kind of not trendy right now, um, but I quite like them still. Um, they're quite universal as well. Everyone knows what a ball loop is. Not everyone knows what the per package is. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to build a cross-validation loop um, for the diabetes data set. And if you did k in in the previous example, you're in luck. Um, but you can easily apply it to GLM or random forests or R part, whichever one you picked as well. So we're going to pick this k in as an example. I want to see how well the k in function does on performing for this particular data set. So the k in function lies in the library class. That's why I call that. I'm going to set k number of folds to be five. Just arbitrary. And we're going to we're going to be using this n later on. We're going to we're just going to get information about how many data points I have. So n is the number of data points there is. No, 768, I believe. And now we're going to split our data set into the predictors. So everything but the class component, and we're going to have the class variable all on its own. And traditionally, in SACS, we call it X for the, the predictor part and Y for the response component. So Y consists of 0 and 1 as a factor, which is if they had diabetes or not. And the X contains all of the information about pregnant, glucose, um, pressure, and so on. So we're going to be using a package here called CD Tools, And that just has a nice little, we're only using one function from that package, which makes um, life a little bit easier when we're running cross-validation. And so, the first thing I want to know is that we set our seed, when we're doing cross-validation, it involves us sampling from our data set. And so if we, want to be, if we run the script again, we want to get the same results coming out, we want to set the seed so that it's like fixed randomness, I describe it as. So if you were to roll a die, you'd get the same heads, like, results coming out. So you don't have to set your seed, but if you run the script again tomorrow, um, you're going to get different results. Oh. Do not mean to do that. Okay. And so the important function we're calling from CV sets is called CV faults, which just makes nice faults for us automatically. And so you don't want to, a lot of time, just get your data and split it into faults as you see it. Because imagine, suppose that the person who combined the data set put all the zeros first and all the ones second. So you want to be able to permute the rows such that you put randomly so many observations in different faults. Just so you get some, you don't want to have patterns in the faults itself. And so what we do is we tell CV sets we want um, K, so the first uh, input is the number of data points you have, that's why we found N before. So we have 768 data points, and big K was the number of faults we want, so in this case it was five. But you could put 10, whatever you like. And so what it does is that it does some thinking and it tells you which data points go into what fold pretty much. And so the important outputs for the CV, the CV folds output is these two things here, subsets and which. This is telling you that, for example, the data point 110 goes into the first fold, 386 goes into the second fold, 469 goes into the third fold, and so on. So it's permuted the indexes here and it's assigned them to faults. And so here comes the for loop. <laughs> so we're going to work through this um, bit by bit. So how do you actually run a cross-validation? So the first thing I would do, we're going to be getting um, an output for every iteration of our loop. So I'm going to set up just an empty vector here called error.fold, which will store the error for the JF fault. So if I've got five fold cross validation, we're going to have five entries in this error.fold vector. And so here we're going to have a for loop that goes through all the faults. So if I've got here, for J in what you could put I, you could put, maybe K is a bit confusing, just <laughs> uh, for J in 1 to K, so it's been 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What this, these two lines do, it just picks out essentially what data points go into the, the testing set. And so fold.j is going to be um, a list, 
not a list, a vector. I keep on, I shouldn't say the word list because um, <laughs> it means something completely different in R. Yeah. So it's a vector of which. Um, so I'll get back the which vector here. So we're looking at the which vector, and we're saying which one of these indices is equal to j. So if I'm looking at the first fold, it's picking out which one of these indexes is equal to one. So it's going to be the first one, the sixth one, the eleventh one, the sixteenth one, and so on. And then what we do here is we subset the subset component of that CV um, sets to be the ones that were equal to the first fold. So in this case, we're going to get out 110, 1, 2, 3, 39, and so on. So all the ones that correspond to a 1, we're pulling them out as indexes for the testing set. So there are our test in. So I like to, I use the word... Well, I inherited from my supervisor. He used ins all the time in his codes, and I use ins all the time in my code. So ins pretty much stands for indices. So test indices or indexes. This and this component here just splits up your data sets into training and testing for both the predictors and the responses. So here I have the testing data points, uh, the data points for the testing rows. And then we have um, the training rows are just minus the testing rows. So if you don't have to worry about specifying um, another training indices, if you just do minus the ones that the ones that are interested, you get the left off behind ones. You then separate the, the response component, so you get y dot test is um, going to be the test indices, and you get the training indices being the ones that weren't the tests. So you're going to get one fifth of your data being tested on, and the remaining four fifths not being tested on. Then all you do is you fit your model um, as usual. So, but you're going to only be testing on training on the training component, and then you predict using the test data, and you're going to see if that matches the data, the response set aside as a testing response. So, remembering here that K and N um, fits and predicts at the same time. So, the first input into K and N is your training data. So, that's X dot train. The next component is the data you want to um, test on, so it's x dot test. The next component is the labels for the training component, so it's y, uh, y dot train. And here I've arbitrarily chosen nine nearest neighbors to consider, but you could, there's no right or wrong. You can pick one nearest neighbor, 20 nearest neighbors, 50 nearest neighbors, whatever you fancy. And so what this fit does is that it fits my model and it's going to predict using the testing data I set aside, what their value should be. So taking the four fifths of my data, the training data, fits the model, and then it spits out um, data that corresponds to the one fifth uh, that I tested it on. And the error for that fold is just how many of those you got wrong. So you have the y dot test sitting aside, the true labels, and you see how well did your model predict those set aside labels that you put on the side. And so it's just the sum of, um, the total sum of the ones that you didn't get right. So if you get a true or fit, does not equal y dot test, you get a true or false vector coming out. And if you take the sum of those, if it treats the true as a one, the false is zero, and you get the total sum of how many you got wrong. So a really good model would have this value being zero, that you got them all right. <laughs> then you repeat that for all the five folds. So then you go on to the second fold being testing, the other ones being training, and you go through all the folds. And so then here, your error dot fold vector will be full, five errors for the five um, repeats of the cross validation. And then because every data point only gets tested once, then you can just say your total error is just the sum of all these errors, divide through by how many data points there are. And in this case, on average, we saw a 26% error rate. So uh, if I use four fifths of my data as training and one fifth to test, pretend it's new data, I get a 26% error rate. And you will find that for this data set that you're not going to get much better than 20%, I don't think. It's very, um, so there's like, sometimes some data sets you won't be able to reach 0% um, cross validation error. So this is a lot to take in, um, but it really shows it's the most mechanical way to imagine that you're going through those folds yourself, splitting up into training and testing,
training it on the four fifths of the data, then predicting on the one fifth, and then going through through all those combinations of training and testing, and seeing on average how well or how poor it performed. So it's very quickly your turn again. And so for this, um, what you can so you don't have to worry about make for the first task. It's still KN, so it's still the same cross-validation loop as here, but what you have to do is you have to embed that in another loop to figure out what is the best value of k for the k nearest neighbors. So we're going to consider k equals 1 to 50. And so what you're going to do is you're going to put that cross-validation loop within a bigger one that just goes through all the values of 1 to 50. And so you get an output that's 50, um, 50 length, and you see which one of those minimize the cross-validation error. Then the second task is just fitting a cross-validation loop for a different method. So uh, fit a cross-validation loop for a random forest, for example. Uh, so you might have to, you have to change the, all you have to do in that code is just change the way you fit the actual model. And then does it perform better than your best value of k you found in task one? And the spoiler alert, I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is, um, you might not get through all of these, which is completely fine. Uh, but it's something to think about. It takes a, this is a, like you learn this in third year stats, so it is a quite a bit of uh, thinking. Uh, but just have a go at it, and I hope you appreciate doing things the hard way, and then the easy way will make everything feel good at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so just put your hand up at all if you've got any questions whatsoever. And so the slide, the, um, there's a different, uh, markdown file for this one, which is called the cross validation R markdown. So we go to exercises. This is the cross validation I should put up on my thing here. So it's this R markdown template here as well, which has the whole reading the data as before. And then you can just uh, fill in the code as well as you go along. And of course, there are solutions as well if you ever get. A little bit stuck. So I've gone through um, KNN and Random Forest. 